Dear laureates, representatives from the Right Livelihood Foundation, dear friends, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to welcome you all to the second chamber in the Swedish Parliament in Riksdag, where the decision was made a hundred years ago to introduce universal suffrage for women and men. For this reason, we are right now celebrating 100 years of democracy in Sweden. Since then, democracy has won many victories around the world. But unfortunately, today we see how democracy is threatened by reactionary regimes and anti-democratic forces in a number of countries. Against this background, the work of Right Livelihood Foundation become even more important. Through the Right Livelihood Award or the Alternative Nobel Prize, the Foundation highlights individuals who can serve as role models in the work for human rights, freedom of speech, democracy and a sustainable world. Individuals who can give us inspiration and energy to continue the work for a more human world. Amanitou Haidar has dedicated her entire adult life to fighting for the rights of her people. She has risked her life being tortured and jailed for several years in Moroccan prison for her peaceful struggle for Western Sahara fundamental right against the over 40 year old illegal Moroccan occupation. Western Sahara has waited far too long and the award give the people new hope that Africa's last colony will finally be free. Gu Yanmei is a Chinese lawyer who has for many years defended and stood up for women's rights in a country where every fourth married women, woman has experienced some form of domestic violence and where discrimination against women in workplaces is increasing. Unfortunately, Gu cannot be here with us today because she was not allowed allow to leave the country. This clearly shows what kind of uh, country China is today. Greta Thunberg received the award for her commitment to the climate and for her inspiration to thousands and thousands of young people around the world to school stri strike for climate. All these young people give me new hope, hope for humanity and the future. They put heavy pressure on us politicians, something that is absolutely necessary. Unfortunately, Greta is not able to, to attend, but representatives from Friday for Future are present, and we are very happy for that. David Kopenawa from Brussels is a respected leader of the indigenous people, Yanomami. Today, we see how the Amazon is being pillaged at a re rapid rate, which is a global threat to climate, the environment, and the ind 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 indigenous peoples living there. David Kopenawa received the award along with the Hutakara Yanomami Association for their brave work on protecting the Amazon forests and biodiversity, as well as the indigenous peoples' ter territories and culture. These four laureates are worthy winners of the Right Livelihood Award and give us hope and show that a better world is possible. And once again, warmly welcome. And with these words, I give the floor to Ole von Uxkull, the executive, executive director of the Right Livelihood Award. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lotta, and uh, welcome to all of you to this seminar where we want to talk about and discuss with the four laureates introduced by Lotta and their representatives. And it is really an enormous privilege for us as Right Livelihood Foundation and our laureates to be invited by two 
speakers of the Swedish Parliament, and by the association Sarla with its chairman Roland Utbult, that is a, an association that has existed for 30 years with members of all the traditional parties of the Swedish Parliament, and that is hosting our laureates here every year. And at this day and age, that the political situation that you described, it is so important that parliamentarians and decision makers seek this interaction with people who are engaged in these important struggles for a better future on the ground. And we're very grateful, and I think it suits the Swedish parliament very well that we can have these debates in this historical chamber. Thank you very much for that. And without further ado, I would then like to introduce a film about our first laureate, Davi Kopenawa. Essa é a mensagem dos Yanomami e Equano para todo o planeta. Nós não queremos garimpo em nossa terra. Nós conhecemos nossos direitos e sabemos que o garimpo da terra indígena é ilegal. Vocês brancos fizeram essa lei, mas vocês mesmos não estão cumprindo. Nós sabemos cuidar da nossa terra floresta. Estamos revoltados porque ainda existe garimpo dentro das nossas comunidades. Queremos a ação. Nossos avós e tios morreram por causa dos garimpeiros. Nós não queremos repetir essa história do massacre. Somos guerreiros de Anomami e Equana. E dissemos todos juntos, Vora Garimpo! <risos> Kopenawa of the Yanomami people is one of the most respected indigenous leaders in Brazil. He has dedicated his life to protecting Yanomami rights, their culture and their lands in the Amazon. Their territory is among the planet's most important reservoirs of biodiversity. Still, it is under constant threat of exploitation for financial gain. Kopenawa was instrumental in uniting indigenous communities in the Amazon. In the 90s, their alliance secured official recognition of the Yanomami land rights to 96,000 square kilometers of land in the rainforest. Together with 11 leaders from Yanomami communities, Kopenawa co-founded the Hutukara Yanomami Association in 2004. Under his leadership, the organization has advanced indigenous rights. Hutakara is actively sharing Yanomami knowledge on how to inhabit their lands sustainably, preserving the rainforest for the benefit of the whole planet and its people. Davi Kopenawa and the Hutukara Yanomami Association, Brazil. So now those of us who don't speak Portuguese have uh, the opportunity to familiarize ourselves with the interpretation equipment that you find at your seats and the channels for the different languages that you see on the screen. And it's now my great honor and pleasure to ask Davi Kopenawa up on stage to deliver his speech. Davi, the floor is yours. If 
Good afternoon to everyone. I, Davi Kapanawa Yanomami, am a representative of the Yanomami and Yekwana peoples. I am a traditional leader in Brazil. I am also a shaman. I heal diseases from the forest. And I am very honored to be here at your house. I'm very, very happy and also deeply touched. It is the first time that I see this house so well organized, such beautiful and happy people in front of me. And I come here to talk to you about the name of my people, Yanomami. Our Yanomami people who live in this planet. So our people and your people, non-indigenous ones, are here to talk about our rights. So, let me give you a message. We are members of the Hutukara Association. I came here with my son, Dario, who is the vice president, and also Mauricio Yekuana, who is responsible for the finances of Utukara Association. I am the president. This organization represents in the cities our people. We built, we founded this organization because we thought to ourselves, we need to have a representation of Yanomami people in the city. It is very important so that we have a voice, so that people hear what the Yanomami people have to say. So I wanted to talk to you about the work that we do. Utukara Association is a tool for us to defend our people, to defend nature, and to defend planet Earth. It is the guardian of the forest that we live in. The forest is what allows us to survive. It is our land, our place, where we were born, where we were born and where we live, and from whom we learn how to look at beautiful mountains, how to admire the beauty of the forest. We stare at these beautiful landscapes, and we have the joy in our hearts. Utokara plays a fundamental role in defending our community. That is what I wanted to say to you. We live in a different way as Yanomami people. We speak a different language, we eat different food, and our home is also different from yours. You've seen it in the video that was played. You could see it. Us, Yanomami and Yekwana peoples, we prefer to stay inside the forest because the forest is our home. 
forest is our, our health. We are connected to the forest. It is an ally to my people, Yanomami. That is what I wanted to say to you, because you don't know it. You don't know the reality of the Yanomami people, the reality of the people of Omama. Omama is our creator. Omama created for us, Yanomami people, all this. Omama also created you, non-indigenous peoples. And that is why we need to learn each other's culture and the culture of our earth. We need to learn how to look at our mother earth and respect it. That is what I wanted to tell you, men, women, young people, authorities. We're all here to discuss, to listen to each other. You're here listening to what Yanomami people say. This is very important. Let's get closer to each other, get to know each other, get to know about different peoples, people from the forest, people from the city. Our world needs us to unite. We need to be together in it, in an alliance. I would love for you to follow this path. We need to choose a good path, a clean path. We all need it. You were born here, but there are other people who are coming, children who are growing up, and we all need to see that we're coming to a limit. And where are we trying to get? It's important to think of it. It's important for us to have a path, a good, a clean path, with no destruction, with no threat, without threatening indigenous peoples, without stealing our land, without killing our indigenous peoples. We don't need to repeat old paths and keep killing indigenous peoples to steal their land. We don't need to continue that. Why people do not need to steal our land any longer? They should stop stealing our territory that we conquered after so much struggle so much blood, so many bloodbaths, so many traditional leaders have died. So you, European people, you, European people, that's what I mean. Please, take a breath, think of it, dream of it, respect my Yanomami, Yekuana people, my indigenous peoples from Brazil who are facing a lot of dangerous issues, dangerous issues that have already come. You've fought a lot in Europe, now all the struggle has come to Brazil. Please. Have an eye on us, even though you are far away. Pay attention to what is happening to us there to prevent bad things from happening to us, to prevent deaths and people invading our houses, people who come to kill our women, our parents, our children. That cannot happen. We are people too. We are Yanomami, Yekwana people. We are human beings who know how to reason, how to think, how to respect. 
That's what I wanted to put into your minds and into your hearts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those wise words and uh, you see the support that you have from people of Sweden and the international crowd gathered here today. And with that, I would like to introduce the film about our next laureate who started her activism just outside this house one and a half years ago, Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg is a teenage climate activist from Sweden. She is the powerful voice of a young generation speaking up on the climate crisis and personifies the notion that everyone has the power to create change. What started as a one-person school strike for climate outside the Swedish parliament soon developed into a movement which has taken the world by storm. Thunberg's resolve not to put up with the looming climate disaster has inspired millions of people to demand immediate climate action. With her outstanding moral clarity, personal integrity and scientific understanding, Greta Thunberg has reconnected the political debate about climate change with relevant facts and priorities. Many people before her have tried to convey the urgency of immediate climate action no one has been more successful. She has managed to get the climate crisis not only on the cover page of newspapers, but also on top of people's minds. Greta Thunberg, Sweden. And it's now... Save, save your applause for our guests. It's my great pleasure to invite Mina and Isabel from Fridays for Future Sweden to join me on stage. <laughs> Mina Pohankova, climate activist with Fridays for Future Sweden. You're in ninth grade at Rolandshov Skolan. Isabel Axelsson, also climate activist with Fridays for Future Sweden and studying human ecology in your first year at Stockholm University. Mina, how did this all start? When were you first outside of the parliament building? Uh, I was uh, the second week. Um, and uh, I read about Greta in the newspapers and I thought, she can't sit there alone. It's too sad. Uh, and I didn't really like to go to school, so I felt, why not go there? Uh, um, but then I learned um, about the climate crisis from Greta and from many uh, scientists who sat uh, beside her. And uh, since then, I have met her every uh, Friday, uh, except from when she's uh, traveling. And it started even before the election, right? When you said in the first weeks, was that before the Swedish parliamentary election? Or yeah, just she started uh, three weeks uh, before the Swedish election. And um, she striked and 
more people, of course, when uh, later on, uh, strike for three weeks, like every day in three weeks. And then after um, the election, uh, all the people who had striked for the, these weeks uh, decided together to continue striking every Friday until uh, Sweden was in line with the Paris Agreement. And what happened next? You met them in December, Isabel, or you exactly. came a little later? Exactly. So I joined the movement pretty much exactly a year ago. Are the microphones now. okay, or do we need... Um, does the technology need to... Can you hear me? Okay, cool. I'll just stand like this then. <laughs> um, so I joined the movement just about a year ago. Uh, there were still not a lot of people at Mintoriet, but so I got to know you guys all very well, all of the strikers of Mintoriet, um, including Greta. And who did you meet out there? There were some parliamentarians coming by, there was maybe press or just passers-by. How did people react to you? Uh, in the beginning, it wasn't that much. Some politicians came by, but they just said, yeah, you're doing great, but you should be in school, so <laughs> please do this on a holiday instead. Um, and uh, then I know it was, it was first like uh, in the spring this year, uh, press started coming a lot. Um, when we had our first global strike, um, when there was, I think 1.5 million youth all over the world striking. And then media started writing a lot about it. Um, and it became really huge. Did you start recognizing some of the parliamentarians? They obviously recognized you. Some of them. Some of them. <laughs> I don't know. What was the typical reaction? You said they said it's a nice thing, but when you started yeah, to discuss like, policy questions, was that possible outside? Uh, no, not really. They, they tell us, oh, um, we are doing as much as we can. And uh, I think you should calm down a bit. Uh, but the thing is that they often uh, tell us we are doing great. But we doesn't want their like appreciation. We want them to act. So it's it's just a weird uh, some total, uh, conversation. A weird conversation to have. <laughs> now it's almost a year later and your movement has made global headlines and at the same time what happens politically is still desperately not enough. Where does your movement stand now? Are you satisfied or are you...? Um, no. Well, I mean, we haven't achieved what we wanted to achieve. I mean, for a year we have been striking, or for over a year we have been striking, for our governments to follow the Paris Agreement, for our governments to act against the climate crisis. We have succeeded in a way that we have caused a lot of attention. We have made lots of people think about the climate and it's at the top of the agenda now, but we still don't see the change that needs to be done. So we have not succeeded in the way that really, really matters. Yeah, in September, the UN Secretary General uh, had uh, um, a summit, uh, an extra summit because of the strikes. Um, but as all of the UN climate summits, nothing happened. It was just empty talk. And that's the problem. Even if they sit together and are planning to do something, they don't. They just have, are talking about it and not taking real uh, action. So what are your plans going forward? Um, we see a poster behind us there. That's like the immediate plan. Can you tell us something about that? So we are going to continue striking every single week until our government is in line with the Paris Agreement as Mina and Greta and the other school strikers decided way back during the election. Uh, but this Friday we are making it bigger than usual because of the COP25 meeting happening in Madrid right now. Um, so we urge all of you to come to our big strike on Friday at 12 o'clock in Rinkby.
What is your reflection on the speech that Davi just gave? Do you see your work here connected with the protests in the Amazon? I think it is quite connected because one of our main demands is climate justice. And without justice for indigenous peoples, there, will, there is no end to the climate crisis. The people that are protecting the forests need to be protected. The people that are protecting the lands and the waters, they are an important part of our planet and the climate's function. Uh, so without rights for everyone, then the climate crisis will not end. When we were preparing this seminar, it was initially not easy to find politicians who dared to be up on stage here and uh, discuss with you. I am very happy to welcome Marlene Bibrevik and Luis Meyer, who take the opportunity to have this discussion with Fridays for Future. Thank you very much. mics also. You will know better than we how they work. <laughs> Marlene, you are a parliamentarian in the Committee on the Environment and Agriculture, representing the Social Democratic Party. And Luis, you are also in that committee and the environmental policy spokesperson of your party, the Moderate Party. And Marlene, excuse me, is with the Social Democratic Party. And um, Climate change is forcing us and will be forcing us to have many important debates, but there are also some debates that I think we have passed. We are no longer going to be debating the underlying scientific facts, and for everyone who does not feel they know enough, there are very good information sites on the internet. For instance, what we have up here is Dagens Nyheter Klimatet Just Nu, where every one of you can look up where climate change stands right now. And this graphic shows how little CO2 budget we have left to emit before we certainly reach irreversible tipping points. Malian, what do you feel as a politician confronted with these scientific facts? Of course, the first thing is uh, a sense of uh, a very great urgency. Uh, and in that case, I, I, of course, agree with the discussions we just heard, that it's very urgent that we quickly do th things. Um, and I also think it's very important to both work within our country. Uh, Sweden, we have a responsibility to do a lot, uh, and also to, to use the power in the European Union. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and also work within the European Union and also in the United Nations. I, I mean, it's very important to see the different levels and that we are a very important uh, voice in all those uh, uh, levels. Uh, and also uh, something that is um, perhaps forgotten uh, in the discussions uh, with, the, with the climate strikes is Sweden has done very much in this sense. But of course, we have to do much more. Uh, one thing that I would say is very positive, that is, we have passed a decision here in the parliament that we have a climate law. And we are uh, agreeing on that. And I think that is a very fundamental base for the v work uh, that we have to do. And, and to see that, that we have a climate law, we have decisions on how we will uh, decrease emissions, uh, and now we are really trying very hard to find the right way to uh, follow the path down. Uh, but the decision is made and we have a climate law in Sweden. Luis, as the uh, opposition parties, the main opposition parties, environmental policy spokesperson, do you agree that uh, the government is doing enough? Well, it would be deceiving of me to stand here and say that the government is doing enough since our emissions are increasing. We see that uh, our emissions have increased by 2% uh, last year, so that's not good. Uh, but I have to underline that uh, 
uh, both the opposition and the government um, is agreeing about the climate goals and how much the reductions have to be uh, in certain years. So I think that's the start and I think it's very um, important that not only governments and opposition in countries agreeing about uh, how to tackle the climate change, but also international cooperation, I think, is the main key, uh, the key to, uh, to be able to uh, decrease the global emissions. If you consider the UN summit that started yesterday, we can see that 27% uh, of all global emissions come from China. And we see that Brazil and uh, the European Union, Union and the US and India all accounts for a very great deal of the total global emissions. And therefore, those kind of questions can't be tackled without uh, international cooperation, even though international co co cooperation uh, in itself uh, it, it goes within itself that it, it's going to take some time and it's going to be slow, um, but I think without it, it's going to be even worse. So well, let, let us go back and let us focus on Sweden again because that is what you are responsible for as parliamentarians. And you are the opposition inside this house and then um, you got another opposition outside the house that was uh, even much more forceful. Um, do you really think you did enough as opposition to criticize the government? policy? Um, well, I think that uh, we are taking the opportunity to uh, point out that our emissions are uh, increasing when they should be decreasing. And uh, um, whether or not we've done it enough, I'm not sure that I should be the one to answer that question. Um, but well, we will hear from well, <laughs> yes. Um, but there are uh, we are agreeing about the goals and the climate, well, our reductions we are agreeing about, but we're, we're not agreeing about how to get there, to the reductions. So there is a political conflict about the way forward to, to reach those goals. Marlene, you want to say something more? Yes. Uh, to other aspects, I think it's um, one thing that uh, uh, is very uh, important in the political discussion when we, we discuss the climate change. It's also that it should be a just transition. It's very important to see the social dim dimensions uh, that, that comes from the climate change uh, and the effects that this has uh, on people. And, and I think it's... Um, uh, so, uh, I listen to what, what you are saying, but it's also important to see what the, deci the decisions make. Uh, uh, and if, if we have countries that is torn apart, uh, from the social issues from the climate change. That can be very dangerous. So you have to combine a tough climate uh, uh, poli policy with also social responsibility. And that is a, a dimension that I, I think it's very important for us politicians to make because of course we, we, we must make a change and we must make it fast. But if we forget the social responsibility, we will face an even uh, more dangerous uh, future. And in this, it's also important to, to stand for hope. That it's, it's important for, for me, and I, I, I suppose for, for you as well, it's important to say that we can make this if we do it together. If we as politicians say, this is, we cannot do anything. This is, you, just look in this, we can just, go home and don't do anything. That is very dangerous. We have to have hope, and we have to be able to show that it, it, it makes difference and if you do the right politically, thing. Politically, we're particularly grateful to have the two of you here together because you with your uh, coalition government and together with the moderate party actually have enough votes in this house to make things happen. Question back to Isabel and Mina. How should they use this power? <laughs> well, I mean, to actually take action. I mean, what you're saying sounds great, but is it good in practice? At the moment, our goals aren't good enough. The goals that you are striving towards, they aren't enough to stop the crisis. Um, and hope is a wonderful thing. I mean, I wouldn't be standing here today if I didn't have a little bit of hope that we could fix this. But the thing is, the hope 
is only strong enough that we actually have to make a difference. I mean, if we don't start acting now, if we don't start acting next year, it's going to be too late, and then what good is hope? Mina, one more word from you, um, and then I'll give it back to you. I would say, uh, you both agree on you're not doing enough, and and still say um, we have to like have hope. The hope is not to feel uh, to feel strength while doing nothing. The hope is when you take action, you get hope. Action is hope. Uh, And if Sweden was uh, doing enough, we would have proven that we are following the Paris Agreement, but we aren't. So we are uh, far away from enough, and you both agree on it. And I think it's weird to say that Sweden is doing everything we can because we aren't, because we are one of the richest countries in the world. And if we can't do enough, who who can then? It's it's uh, it's not um, uh, realistic, a realistic, realistic. Um, way to see. Mm. That, I, I think uh, the last thing that you said is is, is very important also to, to to see in the political debate that we have in Sweden as well, because often uh, still in the political debate. Uh, we can hear that it doesn't matter what Sweden do because uh, the big increase is in, in, in China or India or somewhere else. And I think that uh, you have absolutely right. We have a big responsibility as a rich country, as a country that uh, have uh, done a lot, uh, even if we have still much to do, but we have done a lot. We have a big knowledge. Our industry have a very big knowledge. That's why our Prime Minister was in the United Nations together with, with the leaders of India, starting uh, the big work on how to change the industry uh, at a, a global level. And when we do that, if we can manage that transition, then we will face uh, a large uh, decrease in the emissions. So we have a big responsibility as, uh, as a country. Uh, so we have to really face that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. We have a large responsibility both uh, nationally when it comes to Sweden, but also internationally where rich countries can go f um, be a role model by increasing their emissions, but uh, at the same time, um, um, at the same time, keep uh, keep the economic growth at a, at a level that will spread um, um, that will spread um, wealth welfare uh, through the uh, through the um, well in the country. So I think that's uh, an important way to uh, to tackle the question, to combine it with cutting emissions, but still seeing that economic growth is the way forward. Because by economic growth, we can uh, develop electrical cars, we can develop um, we can transition from the fossil communities to electric communities, and that's a big transition that almost hasn't happened in that dignity uh, in well, in the history of human beings, you could compare it to some transitions, but it's a very big transition from fossil fuels to electricity, and that's where the rich countries can go forward and develop new technologies. Thank you very much. My last question, what would Greta think had she listened to this conversation? That we should not be trusting on the technologies to take us out of this crisis. <laughs> we can't trust that the technologies will get us there. We cannot trust that we will develop fast enough to suck the carbon out of the air in a, in a sustainable way. Um, I think that the discussion is symbolic today. It hasn't taken us far. It hasn't solved the crisis. And I think that's what we should see it as. Thank you, Isabel. Mina, thank you very much, Malian. Thank you, Louise.
And with that, I am proud to introduce our film about Guo Janmei. <laughs> Jan Mei is one of the most distinguished lawyers in the field of women's rights in China. Throughout her career, she has assisted thousands of disadvantaged women in getting access to justice. She has also founded and directed several organizations protecting women's rights with a special focus on domestic violence and gender discrimination. Since 1995, Gore and her teams have offered free legal counseling to more than 120,000 women all over China. They have been involved in more than 4,000 lawsuits to enforce women's rights and advance gender equality, and have submitted over 110 legal research proposals. Their persistent advocacy helped pave the way for the enactment of China's first domestic violence law in 2016. Gore has shown courage and extraordinary resilience, despite increasing restrictions and decreasing funds. Her work continues to impact the lives of millions of Chinese women. Gore Jianmei, China. And as Lotta mentioned, Guo Janmei could not leave China to be with us here today, something that we deeply regret. But she sent us, us her acceptance speech for the award presentation in, in uh, Circus tomorrow, which will be read by the rights activist Karen Tse. And here at the parliament, we would like to read some excerpts from that speech and will be read by Juliana Kronen, member of the Right Livelihood Foundation Board. The Right Livelihood Award recognizes and acknowledges the efforts of my team and me to uphold women's rights and the rule of law in China for the past 25 years. Currently, pro bono legal work in China is facing enormous challenges. This award serves as an encouragement and motivation. In any society, the state of women's liberation is the natural yardstick of universal liberation. Ever since the Fourth World Conference on Women took place in Beijing in 1995, China has indeed achieved progress in the protection of women's rights. But discrimination against women is still a reality in various fields. This affects women's participation in politics, labor, culture, education, marriage and family, as well as when it comes to personal and property rights. Some of the issues are so entrenched that they seem impossible to overcome. During its 24 years of operation, our center has created a unique civil model of pro bono legal aid. The center has carried out a series of pro bono activities, such as free legal counseling services nationwide, legal aid and pro bono litigation, initiating the network of Chinese public interest lawyers, establishing the training and practice center for public interest lawyers, and driving the implementation and improvement of policies related to women's rights and interests. Meanwhile, behind all these achievements are immense challenges and difficulties. The perception that we are outside of the system hinders the dialogue and collaboration between the government, society, and ourselves. The overall lack of gender awareness, legal awareness, public service, and social responsibility in the society subjects our work to all sorts of misunderstandings and even threats. We believe if we are to improve the situation, we should learn to seize opportunities amidst challenges and strive for the advancement and professionalization of public interest lawyers. My aspiration as a public interest lawyer is really very simple. It is to let the sunshine of law lighten up every corner of our life. Those are the words of our the wonderful, courageous laureate, Go Jan Mei.
And luckily, as most of you will know, our contact with the laureates continues even long after the award presentation. So Guo's absence from the program here in Stockholm does not mean that we won't be supporting her and working with her and other laureates for the years to come. And with that, I'm introducing our fourth film about Aminatu Haidar. Aminatu Haidar is an outstanding non-violent activist and human rights defender from Western Sahara, a territory occupied by Morocco since 1975. Over 30 years of peaceful campaigning for the independence of her homeland have earned Haidar the byname Sarawi Gandhi. She has raised awareness about the oppression of her people by organizing demonstrations, documenting cases of torture and carrying out hunger strikes. Her dignity and resolve make her one of the most respected leaders among the Sarawi people. Like many other Sahrawi activists, Haidar has been beaten, tortured and detained without charges or trial. She has spent more than four years in prison for peaceful protesting. Despite death threats and harassment directed at herself and her two children, Haidar tirelessly campaigns for a political solution to one of the world's longest frozen conflicts. Aminatu Haidar, Western Sahara. So please welcome onto the podium the 2019 Right Level Award Laureate from Western Sahara, Aminatu Haidar. Peace, peace be upon all of you. I would like to thank you all, and particularly all the parliamentarians who gave us the possibility to share with you our experience about our sufferings. I would also like to thank the Right Livelihood Foundation to have given me this precious price. It's an honor for my people, for my struggle. My name is Aminatu Haidar, the last colony of Africa, a former victim of enforced disappearance, victim of the colonization of my country by the Kingdom of Morocco, with the shameful complicity of international powers which directly and indirectly support colonialism in Western Sahara, or even worse, simply turn a blind eye on the situation, claiming that everything is fine in the region. My, ex my experience resembled that of many of my compatriots, full of injustice, human rights violations, humiliation, enforced disappearance, torture, and deprivation, but also full of resistance, sacrifice, refusal to submit, and determination to defend human rights and people's rights, dignity, and persistence in the legitimate and peaceful struggle for the freedom of my occupied homeland, which is exploited and vo violated by Morocco, but also by other European countries, such as Spain, France, and the European Union, unfortunately. Unfortunately, the image that the European Union gives today 
is frightening and scandalous. Scandalous. It's an image of a cold, isolated, inhuman Europe that spreads a message of hatred, disrespect for international law and even for European law. So Europe that worships interests at the expense of laws, at the expense of the human and people's rights. A Europe that shamelessly supports the oppression of people. A Europe that concretely participates to the oppressions of people, economic, financial, and political, including the Moroccan expansioning regime, which is the main cause of all political and insecurity, instability in the Maghreb region since the 1960s. Ladies and gentlemen, Morocco is using illegal immigration drugs corrupt politicians and terrorism to force your countries to turn a blind eye to its crimes and support by becoming accomplices themselves. The entire world is aware of this truth, but everyone turns a blind eye because they have to play along. Even here in your country that has been known for decades for its democratic values, Morocco has managed to force you to ignore your own decision taken in 2012 here in the Swedish parliament to recognize the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic. It must also be said that this lack of respect for your own decision has enormously damaged the image of Sweden, especially because during the same year, Sweden took the right decision to recognize the Palestinian government. It is very sad and it has deeply hurt the Sahrawis and their friends everywhere. That is something that must be, uh, that we must be aware of. The Sahrawi people cannot understand why the European countries agree with the Moroccan regime to put pressure on the victims, the Sahrawi people, and their legitimate representative, the Polisario Front, just to please Morocco. And we don't need to go further than last Wednesday, November 27th, when the government of Spain suddenly declared that the Sahrawi refugee camps were dangerous to Spaniards because of the supposed unstable situation in the north of Mali. Note that this declaration was made by Spain immediately after a visit by the Moroccan Minister of External Affairs to Madrid. And there are plenty of other ex examples. We in Western Sahara are struggling for a world of democracy, respect for human rights, sovereignty of peoples over their wealth, respect of the values and principles of international law, governing relations between people and nations, and not a world of violence to the detriment of peace, power to the detriment of rights, interest to the detriment of laws, subjugation and oppression to the detriment of friendship between people and constructive cooperation for peaceful coexistence. The world we want as Sahrawi people, as peaceful defenders of human and people's rights is very different from the world of tyranny, supremacy through the use of arms and violence, massive destruction of all forms of life, of violation of human principles and values. The world, those that are enemies of people, enemies of human rights, and enemies of democracy wherever they are want to impose. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, representative of the Swedish people, I send you one last message. Please do understand. The Sahrawi people have decided their future the day they proclaimed the constitution of their republic back in 1976. They do not need the recognition of anyone to impose their will and they will impose it, whatever the cost, but they would be happy to see Sweden recognize their will and their republic, because Sweden is a country that is very dear to the hearts of Sahrawi, due to the great support that we've always received from the Swedish people and the Swedish governments, and because of the very advanced positions of Sweden on our coast. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I must confess 
that the situation is serious. And Europe, Europe and the European countries, by their complacency or ignorance of our suffering and injustice, have become part of the problem in Western Sahara instead of being part of the solution, a pacific solution. This cannot be accepted by the free citizens of Europe. It must be stopped if we want to avoid the worst in the region in the future. And I would like to thank, to conclude my speech, I would like to thank immensely all the free people that have supported us and that continue and who continue to support us in this room they are parliamentarians that are friends to the sahari people i would like to thank you warmly Thank you so much for this powerful and enlightening speech. Do you hear the French translation? Yeah. And we understand that you've both felt support from Sweden, but you've also felt let down. We, we had a dinner last week where, for instance, you, you thanked our former foreign minister, Jan Eliasson, because Sweden voted against EU fishing agreements with Morocco. What was that about? Uh, <laughs> Puede repetir, por favor? La, la, la interprète. I could take it in French if you want. I can take it in French. Shall I take it in French? Pardon? I can take it in French if you want. Oui. OK. Et que euh, ce que vous avez dit à monsieur Eliasson que la Suède a voté contre Ah oui. I can interpret in French next time. Oui, j'ai j'ai je, je l'ai remercié aussi. Yes, I have congratulated him because 2006 Sweden voted against the fishery agreement. Sweden was the only country to work to to vote against them those fishery agreement and that's how that is Sweden but unfortunately in 2012 Sweden um, decided not to act abstained but we need more concrete actions in your speech was about the resolution taken by this Parliament asking the Swedish government to recognize Western Sahara. That was in 2012. What, what hope did this decision by parliament instill among the people of Western Sahara? Yes, we were very happy about this decision we were very proud of the values of the Swedish people because this institution represents the Swedish people. But unfortunately, 
this decision wa was wasted. The decision wasn't implemented by the Swedish government because of the pressure of uh, Morocco with the support of uh, France and other European uh, governments. So our wish is that Sweden takes the lead regarding democracy and show Europe that they need to recognize the Sahrawi people, a people that deserve to be recognized. They are protected by the law, by international law, by all laws, including European laws, because the European Court of Justice as stated in 2016 and 2018 that Western Sahara and Morocco are two separate territories, that Morocco has not, no sovereignty upon Western Sahara, and that Morocco can't conclude trading and fishery agreements in the name of Western Sahara. But unfortunately, it happened. Euro the European Union concluded trade agreements together with Morocco. We were very disappointed and that hurt um, us and this um, destroyed the, 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 the image we had of Europe. And now I have no more arguments towards our young people. Uh, they do not believe in human rights anymore. They see Europe being an accomplice of Morocco. Et pour continuer la discussion, j'ai maintenant le plus. Foschlund and Friedrich Malm to join us on stage. Welcome. Friedrich, representing the Liberal Party. You are on the Committee on Foreign Policy and also the spokesperson on foreign policy and migration of your party group. And Kenneth Foschlund, also on the Foreign Policy Committee and the Social Democratic Party Group's spokesperson on foreign policy. A warm welcome. And it was the Social Democratic Party Group together with other parties that in 2012 had initiated this vote in Parliament that Aminatu was mentioning, now you control the government. At the time, you asked a government controlled by the alliance parties to recognize Western Sahara, but now you control the government. But you could take the decision, but the government decided differently. Tell us what happened. Well, what happened after the uh, decision here in the parliament in 2012 was that the then present government, the center-right government, coalition government, uh, decided not to go forward with this and put it to the archive, so to say. Uh, and there were no formal obligations for the then later on incoming social democratic-led government, but anyway, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Margot Wallström, brought the issue up and uh, um, made a decision to have an inquiry about the possibilities for a recognition. And the outcome of this uh, uh, inquiry was that, unfortunately, there aren't the premises at the moment for uh, a recognition. But the purpose of the work that we are carrying out in the government, or they are rather, since I'm not a member of the government, is to come in the future to a situation where it is a possibility to actually um, declare that we recognize Western Sahara as a uh, country. And to be able to come so far, we have to 
uh, get up the speed in the peace process in the negotiations about the status of the two countries and we um, put a lot of our confidence and hope to the UN process that has been invoked and has uh, made some progresses although it's going uh, terribly slow especially if you are from Western Sahara. You talk about the uh, speed at which it would be necessary to see some progress. I mean, Natu spoke about the young people who are losing their patience. Isn't it a problem that there is much more attention and also government action when we see violent protests, but this uh, nonviolent process in uh, Western Sahara has really not met with a lot of urgent treatment? Maybe a question to you, Friedrich. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to be here uh, today. Um, and and a, a big congratulations also to Mrs. Haidar uh, for, for this award. It's so well deserved. You have been struggling and working so hard for decades uh, for the Saharawi people. And uh, your land has been occupied since 1975. And, uh, I, I really agree with everything you said uh, at the podium earlier uh, as well. Um, I think that there are some problems here regarding what is so-called European interests. Um, we were talking about climate change here earlier. I, I would say that the European governments are, are, there is one thing that they are more worried about at least than climate change, uh, and that is migration flows. And uh, therefore, uh, the European Union countries tend to um, rely on countries like Turkey or Morocco and other countries in order to try to uh, make people stay on the African continent. And, and I think that uh, that has to be taken into consideration when we, when we see what is happening in, in Western Sahara and why the politicians are not speaking up enough, speaking out about, about the suffering and the oppression. Uh, in, in this summer, for example, people uh, in Western Sahara were um, uh, applauding when uh, Algeria won a game in the African Cup, uh, Nations Cup, and uh, actually one person was killed in the, uh, on the use of extremely excessive force uh, from the uh, Moroccan security uh, forces uh, against uh, civilian people, uh, unarmed people, uh, who, who were protesting non-violently. And, and we see that so often, almost every day there are harassments and, and people are being captured, tortured and so on. And I think it's so sad to see that the rest of the world is doing so little about this. So would, would you say that our government is being blackmailed by Morocco because of potential migration flows? No, I would say that... So we had the question of uh, street children, Moroccan street children, that Sweden wanted Morocco to receive back, and they wouldn't until I would say we changed that, our position on Western Sahara. Yeah, well, it's the same if you ask a Kurd in Turkey. Uh, where is the pressure on Turkey at the moment? And, and you can see that we have this migration uh, agreement uh, with, with the Erdogan government. And I think that it's problematic from a human rights uh, view uh, if, if we are promoting human rights, we cannot, I mean, accept these oppressions in countries just because we have to rely on them on other issues. I think that we need to be very clear on which, which values and moral ethics we, 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 we should have in, in, in free countries and, and also demand more reforms from countries like Morocco. What well, is your take on that? What, what kind of pressure uh, were you exposed to from Morocco on these questions? Well, it's no secret that uh, we as uh, parliamentarians and members of the Foreign Affairs Committee has been under high pressure from different uh, Moroccan interests. And we have had several meetings here in the parliament where we have received parliamentarians from Morocco. We have had very straight out discussions with them where we have sh shown a, a very united Swedish position on the rights of the Western Saharan people, uh, although we have different ideas in different parties on how to move forward. Do remember the fact that the Liberals 
are previous members of the center-right coalition government who didn't put forward the, the recognition when it was decided by the uh, parliament. So we see different paths ahead. But what is really saddening me is what you mentioned earlier. And that is the contrast of your fight. Because picture as being a Gandhi of uh, uh, Western Sahara, that is one of the most nice things I can, I th can think of saying about anybody. Because to me, the peaceful struggle for freedom and democracy is the role model. I'm a reformist. I'm a social democratic reformist. And I cherish the work of peaceful people trying to claim their rights, but in, but in a peaceful manner. But I can at the same time understand the youth growing up now seeing the development, the path of the development, and giving up hope. I can understand that. I don't uh, recommend it. I don't welcome it. I can un understand it uh, in my mind. Uh, but I hope that you are able, with your fight, if one could call it a fight anyway, to still promote them to, to stay on the peaceful way because that is the only way, I think, in the end that will create a stable change because the real downside of rapid and revolutionary changes, in my mind, is that they seldomly, almost never, comes into stable and solid changes. Aminatu, we are uh, approaching Christmas here in Sweden, and if you had one wish from these two gentlemen, what would you like to hear from them as Swedish parliamentarians? I would like to thank them. I would like to thank them for their solidarity, first of all, and I do understand that just like me you want young people to believe in a peaceful struggle you want them to be patient that is also my wish but i'm calling upon you please support me in that peaceful struggle hinder the exploitation of our natural resources by morocco let us be firm against this violation of international rights, violation of European rights. That's my wish. And I do hope that my wish will come true very soon. Yes. the moment, I think the biggest and greatest hope to all of you, uh, all of us, is actually the EU court. Since Sweden is a very un small minority nowadays in the European Union, standing up for the rights of the Western Saharan people, actually uh, we are depending a lot now on the EU court. Yes, that is... That is true. Uh, there were before a, a few other countries in the European Union who were on the same line. They were allied uh, with, with us. But at the moment, uh, we are very lonely, actually, Sweden in the, in the European Union. Um, and, and I think that our country can do much more, of course. Uh, but we need to see that there are some strong forces in other parts of Europe who are um, investing heavily in, in, uh, in Morocco and also have their relations with the, with the government in Morocco, which uh, has not only to do with commercial and business activities, but also with the risk of migration flows and so on. But we try to stand up by and, and, and always raising the human rights dimension. And uh, I think that what we see now is, is, is a frozen conflict, someone said earlier. It's not really a, a frozen conflict. It's, it's very alive. It's a daily struggle. It's a daily oppression. Uh, but there seems to be no really solution. 
and, and I think that, that uh, thank you so much for all the work you are doing and, and, uh, and I hope that, that more people will stand up and, 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 um, and speak out uh, about what is, what is happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. And my final question to you, Aminatu, we spoke about the urgency also in the context of our earlier debate on the climate and about tipping points. And you mentioned, Kenneth, how slow the UN process is. How much time do we have left to finally move on this question and recognize the struggle of your people and for them to see some results? I can't tell you how much time we have left. It depends on the international community. It is the internationality that has to find the will to solve the problem and to accomplish the uh, decolonization process and to give us our democratic pathway to choose. And we have a hope to be united together in our homeland, to become a respected people. That can use all of its legitimate rights and, li li and live in peace in Western Sahara. I can't tell you how much time we have. Uh, I can't tell, I can't give you a time frame. I can just say that the complicity that we see today must come to an end. This complicity with Morocco, as uh, Sahara, um, Western Sahara must be free, independent. Thank you, Kenneth Foschlum. Dear uh, laureates, representatives of uh, Right Livelihood uh, Foundation, and uh, all other participants in this uh, seminar, I think we have got the message from the laureates uh, talking about their experience and their struggle for rights, be it uh, the indigenous people and the indigenous people's rights, women's, right, women's rights in China, the Western Sahara experience and the rights of occupied peoples. 
and uh, of course, Fridays for a future. We have all of us seen people making change happen. We know the importance, all of us are making a difference. And we have learned today from people really making a difference for their people and for their communities and for all of us by that. I think we have seen leadership, engagement, inspiration, and bravery. And we salute you all for that. And uh, I also think that uh, we all sh uh, should remember that uh, suddenly dreams can come through. It depends on all of us and what we are striving for. But uh, keep the dream with you when leaving this seminar. And um, I hope and wish you all a great tomorrow for the laureates, the ceremony tomorrow at Circus. But for all of us, not only Fridays for future, but all days for future is important. So uh, keep it with you as I will do. And uh, thank you all for sharing with us your experiences. And by that, I would like as the deputy speaker to conclude this seminar and wish you all the best for the future. Thank you.